Écoutez, écoutez, bonjour à tous. Euh, ben Peut-être, euh, Christophe, tu, 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 veux, euh, tu veux commencer sur cette euh, session consacrée Bonjour à tous, je pense que nous allons pouvoir euh, commencer en cette euh, fin d'après-midi. Certains vont parler de nocturne, je, je, je pense que c'est le cas. Euh, donc je, je suis médecin psychiatre, Christophe Daudet, je ne suis pas du tout addictologue. Par contre, le, dans le, le champ de la neuromodulation et de la stimulation cérébrale transcrânienne, euh, il est évident que le traitement, en tout cas les protocoles de traitement des troubles addictifs, euh, fait, euh, peut-être pas encore le buzz, mais effectivement fait l'actualité euh, au dernier congrès de Brain Stimulation à Lisbonne. C'est effectivement dans le domaine de la recherche sur, sur l'addiction et notamment sur euh, l'alcool, les troubles d'utilisation de, de, d'alcool qui effectivement euh, a été euh, promu euh, en tant que chercheuse de l'année, Colin Hanlon. Euh, donc cette session dont je suis très heureux et honoré de participer en tant que modérateur euh, tourne autour effectivement de la neuromodulation, on pourrait presque même dire autour de la deep TMS, autour de, de l'addiction et du TOC comme modèle de l'addiction. Alors nous aurons, nous aurons trois, trois orateurs, euh, un français et deux anglais speakers. Tu, tu, tu feras ta communication en français, en anglais En français. En français. Et euh, nous, nous commençons donc par le professeur Bruno Millet, qui euh, euh, est professeur de psychiatrie aux universités de santé Paris-Sorbonne et qui est le, le responsable de l'unité STOCAD qui est une unité de stimulation transcrânienne des troubles sociaux compulsifs, d'addiction et euh, troubles affectifs. Absolument. Et qui est un éminent spécialiste de ces circuits. Donc, euh, nous laissons la parole et nous sommes heureux de t'écouter. Alors, euh, bon, donc, euh, bonsoir à, à tous. Euh, on voit bien qu'aujourd'hui, le, le, le champ de la, de la brain stimulation et de la neuromodulation... Euh, a encore du mal à prendre dans les congrès d'addictologie. Euh, nul doute que cela va changer parce que euh, nous pensons, et nous sommes euh, nombreux à le penser, que euh, ces traitements par stimulation cérébrale peuvent être euh, utiles euh, au traitement de, de, de patients souffrant de troubles addictifs. Alors, euh, je, je dois dire que moi, j'ai décidé de commencer et de proposer cette intervention à ce congrès auquel j'ai plaisir à, à venir, en commençant d'abord par prendre le modèle du trouble obsessionnel compulsif comme modèle d'addiction. Et euh, en écoutant euh, ce matin les présentations, euh, cet après-midi encore sur euh, la session consacrée euh, au, à la, à la co-occurrence euh, et stress, stress post-traumatique et addiction, vous devez peut-être vous dire qu'on est assez loin de la co-occurrence trouble obsessionnel compulsif et addiction. Et pourtant, c'était cette présentation, c'est pour vous inviter à réfléchir à cette pathologie qui est peut-être moins connue et moins spectaculaire que les troubles addictifs, et puis pour vous amener progressivement à l'idée, en tout cas à l'hypothèse selon laquelle le modèle du trouble obsessionnel compulsif se, euh, se marie bien et, et peut, euh, peut, peut présenter certaines similitudes avec des troubles addictifs. Et vous allez voir aussi du coup que le trouble obsessionnel compulsif a beaucoup progressé ces dernières années. La connaissance du trouble obsessionnel compulsif a beaucoup euh, progressé ces dernières années euh, grâce aux techniques de stimulation cérébrale. Alors je vais, voilà le plan que je vais, que je vais suivre. Donc euh, un, je vais passer un petit peu de temps à vous présenter le trouble obsessionnel compulsif. Puis je prendrai deux exemples d'addiction, l'addiction comportementale et l'addiction aux substances pour vous montrer les similitudes qu'il peut y avoir en termes de physiopathologie, mais aussi en termes de thérapeutique. 
Alors, sur le, le trouble obsessionnel compulsif, finalement, euh, le, c'est ce qui domine dans le trouble obsessionnel compulsif, c'est la pensée parasite. La pensée euh, qui fait intrusion à l'esprit du sujet dont il ne peut se départir. Alors, ça peut avoir avec la saleté, avec euh, des, euh, la peur de commettre un acte contre sa volonté, et il ne va pas sortir de cette problématique-là. Ce que entraîne cette idée obsédante, c'est un niveau d'anxiété extrêmement important. Et ce qui est très surprenant, c'est que, enfin très surprenant quand on essaye de le, d'examiner les choses sur le plan physiopathologique, c'est qu'il y a une réaction comportementale, une réaction, un, une compulsion, un comportement excessif, stéréotypé, que le sujet se sent obligé d'accomplir même si l'on reconnaît le caractère absurde, le caractère excessif et le caractère euh, perte de temps et, et, et l'isolement que cela peut euh, entraîner. Et donc, euh, ces gens-là vont être pris par ce parasitage de la pensée, avec des conséquences qui sont, je le disais à l'instant, l'isolement et l'enfermement dans la compulsivité. Alors, qu'est-ce que l'on sait de ce trouble. Aujourd'hui, on sait de ce trouble, après euh, plus de, de, de 20 ou 30 ans d'études sur la physiologie, euh, on sait d'abord que c'est une maladie. Euh, alors, comment la, la, la définir On pourrait dire du, euh, de, du, 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 de la perte du contrôle euh, de, de la pensée, et en particulier la difficulté que les sujets souffrant de TOC ont, c'est inhiber leur propre pensée. C'est-à-dire que ce qu'ils voient émerger à leur esprit, c'est une pensée qu'ils ne contrôlent pas et qui accède à leur conscience. Vous allez me dire, c'est la définition de la pensée. Mais disons que c'est ce caractère incoercible qu'il va faire qu'ils vont ne pas pouvoir se réfréner et donc, en réponse à ça, être obligés d'accomplir des comportements. La plupart des études le montrent, euh, ce qui euh, domine, je ne sais pas où est, pardon, c'est euh, euh, la plupart des... Je sais pas si on peut le montrer. Son pointeur, hop, voilà. La plupart des études le montrent, ce qui domine dans cette pathologie-là, lorsque l'on compare un groupe de patients souffrant de TOC à des sujets normaux, c'est l'hyperactivité préfrontale au niveau métabolique. Ça, c'est une étude de Baxter dans les années 92 et euh, près de euh, 20 ans plus tard, nous reproduisions cela avec une hyperactivité orbitofrontale que l'on retrouve sur un groupe de sujets TOC, à peu près une vingtaine de sujets TOC. Donc c'est dire que, alors ça se voit à un niveau groupal, au niveau individuel, la différence n'est pas suffisamment importante et cette hyperactivité métabolique n'est pas suffisamment importante pour que l'on puisse considérer ce test comme un test utilisable et un outil de neuroimagerie utilisable à l'échelle individuelle, mais c'est une constante, c'est un des, 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 des résultats les plus robustes que l'on observe. Il faut aussi ajouter qu'à cette hyperactivité préfrontale, une activité des ganglions de la base. Donc ces résultats ont conduit finalement à développer une physiopathologie, une réflexion sur la physiopathologie dans le trouble obsessionnel compulsif et l'implication de circuits, de circuits corticaux, sous-corticaux, c'est-à-dire de réseaux neuronaux qui, euh, euh, finalement, sont intégrés, qui sont intégrés chez le sujet euh, euh, normal, chez le sujet sain, et qui permettent de contrôler la motricité, mais aussi de contrôler les cognitions et de contrôler, finalement, ces idées obsédantes. Et euh, à partir de là, et à partir de ces travaux de neuroimagerie, de physiopathologie sur ces circuits corticaux, eh bien de la même façon que l'on intervient sur des sujets souffrant de pathologies motrices comme la dystonie ou la maladie de Parkinson, il est venu à l'idée d'intervenir sur, euh, chez des patients souffrant de euh, troubles obsessionnels compulsifs. Nous allons le voir un petit peu plus tard. Mais... Ça a permis quand même de réfléchir beaucoup sur ces circuits, finalement, qui sont impliqués dans le trouble obsessionnel compulsif. Et dans ma réflexion, en comparant le TOC à des pathologies addictives, je me disais, finalement, les problèmes des les patients qui souffrent de TOC 
ont des problèmes de prise de décision. Nous allons voir que, évidemment, c'est le cas dans les, chez les patients souffrant de troubles addictifs. Il y a aussi un problème de contrôle de l'inhibition, avec une tendance à surcontrôler leur inhibition, alors que c'est plutôt le, 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 le contraire dans l'addiction. Troisième aspect, c'est l'évolution du, euh, du trouble obsessionnel compulsif sur plusieurs années. En fait, il s'avère qu'à l'origine, le patient qui euh, va accomplir ses compulsions, ses comportements répétitifs, le fait en réponse à une idée obsédante. Celui qui va commencer à se laver les mains et le corps le fait en, une, en réponse à l'idée obsédante que euh, son euh, corps est sale ou qu'il est potentiellement contaminé. Mais au fur et à mesure de l'évolution de la pathologie, le, le, le trouble obsessionnel compulsif va développer des raisons, on va dire, plus dorsaux, plus en charge des aspects comportementaux et moteurs, et la procédure va devenir automatique, au point que, lorsque l'on interroge des patients souffrant de TOC et qu'on leur demande les raisons pour lesquelles ils accomplissent leur lavage de main ou leur lavage de corps, ils répondent la plupart du temps que c'est en rapport avec l'obsession de la saleté, mais la procédure comportementale, elle est acquise, elle est programmée, et elle est souvent, j'allais dire, rédhibitoire, presque irréversible, à essayer de supprimer. Alors, euh, aujourd'hui, euh, les thérapeutiques dans le TOC, ben, on utilise, et je vais assez vite, les inhibiteurs de la recapture de la sérotonine et euh, qui permettent de traiter les obsessions. C'est probablement ces médicaments-là qui agissent le mieux sur le parasitage et la diminution de la fréquence des pensées obsédantes. Et le traitement des compulsions, on va utiliser l'exposition avec prévention de la réponse, une technique, une thérapie comportementale, qui consiste finalement à proposer aux euh, patients de s'exposer à ce qu'ils redoutent et de, 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 de ne pas effectuer euh, l'accomplissement de ces rituels de lavage qui ne font que euh, euh, conditionner l'individu à euh, son comportement euh, compulsif. Et les outils d'évaluation, l'outil d'évaluation le plus connu, c'est la Y-Box, la Yen Brown Obsessive, Compulsive Scale, et vous allez voir que euh, aussi maintenant dans les addictions, un certain nombre d'outils euh, sont issus de cette technique. Alors, sur, la, sur les thérapeutiques, dans le TOC, il y a aujourd'hui des thérapeutiques autres que les médicaments et les psychothérapies, c'est les techniques de stimulation cérébrale. Alors, je devrais peut-être commencer par la technique la plus invasive, celle qui a conduit à l'usage de la RTMS, mais toujours est-il que vous allez voir un certain nombre de de données sur la RTMS dans le trouble obsessionnel compulsif. Nous avons, nous, publié en 2014 un papier dans Translational Psychiatry montrant que l'inhibition à basse fréquence du cortex orbitofrontal améliorait la symptomatologie obsessionnelle et compulsive. De la même façon, vous n'êtes peut-être pas sans savoir que euh, une équipe israélienne, euh, coordonnée, je crois, par Abraham Zangen, qui va euh, suivre, a, euh, et, et, et soutenue par euh, une entreprise qui est Brainsway, a développé l'usage de la DIP RTMS, donc la RTMS, mais appliquée grâce à une technique spécifique qui est l'usage d'un casque qui permet d'aller plus en profondeur et d'atteindre certaines structures spécifiques comme le cortex singulaire, eh bien, cette équipe a montré l'efficacité de, euh, euh, de la DIP RTMS dans un papier qui, est, qui a été publié en 2018 dans le journal Brain Stimulation. Où vous voyez ici en abscisse donc, le temps, on va jusqu'à euh, 8 semaines, et puis en ordonnée la white box. Et lorsque vous comparez les sujets euh, souffrant euh, de, euh, de, de, de TOC, mais euh, certains présentent euh, la stimulation, la vraie stimulation avec le Brainsway, et autre, les autres présentent une stimulation CHAM, il existe une différence significative qui apparaît dès la euh, quatrième semaine. Donc un, un certain nombre d'arguments pour dire que déjà la stimulation magnétique, euh, euh, la stimulation magnétique transcrânienne est efficace dans le trouble obsessionnel compulsif. Alors juste pour dire aussi que 
Dans le TOC, ce qui a changé aussi la pathologie, c'est la connaissance que nous avons et l'utilisation de la stimulation cérébrale profonde du noyau subthalamique d'un côté, c'est une publication française dans le New England Journal of Medicine en 2008, mais également la stimulation du striatum ventral et notamment du nucleus accumbens qui ont permis de montrer que la stimulation des ganglions de la base et en particulier du striatum ventral pouvait améliorer considérablement la symptomatologie des patients souffrant de troubles obsessionnels compulsifs. Donc, vous voyez, un certain nombre d'arguments, une physiopathologie assez élaborée, des thérapeutiques, je voudrais juste dire un mot peut-être sur la stimulation cérébrale profonde pour vous dire que cette technique, cette technique est la seule soit sur le striatum ventral, soit sur le noyau subthalamique, qui permet de faire disparaître complètement des troubles obsessionnels compulsifs. Donc c'est dire euh, l'importance et euh, l'influence de ce type de stimulation de structure corticale profonde. Alors maintenant, j'arrive sur des choses évidemment que je connais moins, qui sont euh, les pathologies addictives, mais euh, je me suis posé la question de savoir ce qu'il en était chez des gens qui euh, souffraient notamment de ce qu'on appelle des addictions comportementales, des addictions sans substance, et j'ai pris l'exemple le, le, du gambling disorder. Et euh, finalement, on retrouve toujours une symptomatologie clinique qui est à peu près euh, similaire, avec d'un côté, non pas l'obsession cette fois-ci, mais la préoccupation pour le gain, en l'occurrence, l'attrait pour le gain qui va se transformer en préoccupation pour le gain, qui entraîne de l'anxiété et, on va le voir par la suite, une détresse, la compulsion de jeu qui emmène le joueur à utiliser de façon excessive et abusive le jeu, y compris à ses dépens, et puis retour avec une compulsion de jeu qui, au contraire d'atténuer l'idée obsédante et le craving, ce matin on parlait de craving, ne va faire que l'accentuer avec un cercle vicieux dans lequel rentrent les joueurs pathologiques à leur dépens, à leur dépens avec des pertes d'argent, une désocialisation et puis euh, chasing loss, c'est-à-dire ils cherchent à réparer les pertes, mais en vain, et donc ils retombent finalement dans la même, dans la même préoccupation euh, comportementale et addictogène. Alors j'ai regardé un petit peu ce qu'il était écrit sur le gambling disorder, la physiopathologie. Difficulté de prise de décision, contrôle de l'inhibition sont des anomalies cognitives qui sont mises en avant dans, euh, le, euh, dans ce, 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 cette pathologie. Et puis euh, également le, le delay discounting. Alors le delay discounting, vous savez, c'est cette tâche qui permet de savoir si vous êtes un impulsif ou si au contraire vous contrôlez bien votre, euh, votre capacité à différer les choses pour, pour obtenir un gain plus important si vous différez, plutôt qu'un gain immédiat mais moindre si vous décidez de choisir le gain immédiat. Eh bien, euh, dans le gambling disorder, que ce soit avant ou après traitement, eh bien, le, le, cette, cette capacité à différer la récompense ne serait pas euh, différente, euh, significative, ce qui pose des questions sur le traitement dans le jeu pathologique. Alors, ce qui est amusant aussi, quand on regarde un peu la physiopathologie, il y a assez peu d'études qui sont réalisées sur le jeu pathologique, encore qu'il y en a de plus en plus, des éléments sur le fait que la dopamine et la sérotonine, comme dans le TOC, sont impliqués, et puis ce sont les circuits, les mêmes circuits qui sont impliqués dans le système de récompense, les circuits ventraux, ceux que l'on retrouve impliqués dans le début de la pathologie obsessionnelle compulsive. Et l'évolution eh bien, elle est similaire à celle des TOC avec de nombreuses rechutes. J'ai également regardé sur les thérapeutiques, et quand on regarde bien la thérapeutique, une fois que vous avez l'abstinence, eh bien, la première phase qui consiste à mettre à distance l'individu de, de cette compulsion ludique, eh bien, vous regardez les, les, les médicaments, bien sûr, des, des antagonistes opiacés qui ont pu montrer leur efficacité, l'analtrexone et l'anaméphène, 
mais aussi des inhibiteurs de la recapture de la sérotonine, comme c'est bizarre, les mêmes que ceux qui sont actifs dans le, dans le trouble obsessionnel compulsif, avec l'absence d'autorisation de mise sur le marché ni aux états unis ni en Europe pour ces médicaments, mais pas plus pour les antagonistes opiacés que pour les inhibiteurs de la recapture de la sérotonine. Et la thérapie comportementale est également utilisée pour permettre aux patients de gérer les envies de jouer. J'ai regardé ce qu'il y avait dans la brain stimulation, pas grand-chose quand même, quelques études qui semblent montrer que dans certains cas, la RTMS peut être efficace et à la fois les méta-analyses ne font pas état de résultats significativement différents et ne permettent pas de conclure à l'efficacité de cette technique. Dernière comparaison, à comparaison du TOC avec l'addiction avec support, et donc là j'ai pris l'alcool, hein, l'utilisation, la substance use, alcool substance use, et on voit bien que la problématique est la même, la même que ce que, que les TOC présentent. Au début, il y a un attrait pour l'alcool à viser de désinhibition, et puis, rapidement, euh, ben, l'attrait eh, va se transformer en euh, craving, avec euh, à chaque fois que vous buvez, eh bien, euh, au lieu d'obtenir euh, une atténuation de votre anxiété et de votre préoccupation, cela ne va faire qu'accentuer les choses, et très rapidement, vous rentrez dans ce cercle vicieux dont on ne peut pas sortir, avec euh, la préoccupation pour la boisson qui devient la, pr la préoccupation principale de l'individu, l'anxiété ou le craving, je ne sais pas comment le, le définir, la recherche compulsive, avec le cortège de conséquences néfastes qui euh, en euh, découle, à savoir la perte d'argent, bien sûr, le, euh, pardon, le, euh, la désocialisation, je vais y arriver, la désocialisation, les difficultés médico-légales, et surtout, et surtout, la destruction corticale et sous cortical des patients souffrant de dépendance alcoolique. Alors quand on regarde la psychométrie, bien, on voit que quand même les spécialistes ont euh, utilisé des outils qui sont quand même très comparables à la, à la white box avec la obsessive compulsive du drinking scale qui est maintenant utilisée dans beaucoup d'échelles comparatives lorsque l'on veut évaluer le retentissement d'une thérapeutique, et puis aussi dit obsessive compulsive drug use scale, avec euh, des troubles sur le plan évolutif qui doivent être évidemment considérés comme des troubles chroniques, à pousser, avec des rémissions, et avec des estimations de rechute qui sont évaluées entre 40 et 60%. Alors, lorsque l'on regarde pour, sur la physiopathologie de l'addiction, il y a de magnifiques articles. Il y en a que l'on attend avec beaucoup d'impatience, n'est-ce pas, euh, Alain Mais, euh, évidemment, il y a ce papier extraordinaire de, de, de Neuroscience of Drug Reward and Addiction de, de Nora Volkov, où, euh, effectivement, on voit tout le système de récompense qui est impliqué, mais aussi beaucoup d'autres euh, systèmes... Euh, euh, des, des réseaux avec notamment euh, qui prennent en compte la préoccupation, l'anticipation et euh, l'interoception par rapport aux patients souffrant de, de troubles alcooliques, mais toujours quand même ces boucles striato-cortico-thalamique, cortico sous cortical. Si l'on regarde maintenant l'intérêt de la stimulation cérébrale, eh bien on s'aperçoit que euh, les, les, la RTMS peut avoir des intérêts avec euh, notamment sur des endroits qui ont montré qu'ils étaient atteints par la consommation d'alcool. Mais par exemple, en IRM fonctionnel, les signaux du striatum dorsal sont plus importants chez les gros buveurs par rapport aux buveurs sociaux. Et une activation induite par les signaux plus élevés du striatum ventral et des zones fréquentales chez les buveurs sociaux par rapport aux gros buveurs. Si cette, ça, cette phrase veut dire qu'en IRM fonctionnel, vous observez exactement la même chose que ce que vous observez dans les TOC. Au fur et à mesure que l'alcool prend le pas sur l'individu, les systèmes d'automaticité, les systèmes comportementaux de procédures d'apprentissage répétées vont prendre le pas sur le, le primum movens de la pathologie, qui est l'idée obsédante, la préoccupation obsédante de se procurer le, le produit ou d'être parasité par des idées obsédantes, comme c'est le cas dans le trouble obsessionnel compulsif. 
Alors, euh, je reviens juste en arrière pour vous dire que euh, beaucoup de choses sont faites aujourd'hui, maintenant, dans euh, l'usage de substances. Et plutôt que de présenter des études qui vont être présentées par, euh, euh, par Abraham Zangen, certainement dans une minute, je voudrais juste vous montrer ce, ce, cet exemple, ce cas clinique de ce patient qui siège avec le casque Brainsway et euh, qui est venu me voir euh, une histoire d'alcool finalement assez classique, 48 ans, artisan électricien, euh, alcoolodépendance depuis 6 ans, le premier verre d'alcool à 23 ans, père alcoolique, décédé des suites d'un cancer à l'estomac. Un lundi matin, il découvre son meilleur ami et collègue pendu dans son atelier, cette personne ayant été alcoolique de très, de très nombreuses années. Et ce patient a la remarque suivante, il nous dit « Le traumatisme était tel que cela m'a pro provoqué un déclenchement quasi instantané de prendre de l'alcool de l'ordre d'une bouteille de whisky par jour. » Alors on peut s'intéresser sur le, le, le côté un peu autosuicidaire de l'individu qui, voyant son ami se pendre à cause probablement des conséquences de l'alcool, lui-même va tomber dans la, même, dans la même pathologie. Et donc, il décrit eh l'escalade, la désocialisation. On lui propose 20 séances de RTMS, c'était il y a près de deux ans, 20 séances de deep RTMS, et euh, aujourd'hui, le patient est sobre depuis 226 jours. Il n'a pas touché une goutte d'alcool. Alors, est-ce que c'est une thérapeutique miracle c'est peut-être pas une thérapeutique miracle, mais c'est une thérapeutique qui peut aider. En ce sens que le, que le casque qui est utilisé et le casque H7, le même que celui qui est utilisé dans le trouble obsessionnel compulsif, qu'il cible une, euh, une, un, une structure neuroanatomique qui est euh, l'air singulaire antérieur et l'air du cortex préfrontal médial, qui sont des cibles extrêmement importantes dans le trouble obsessionnel compulsif. De là à dire que cette technique est capable, de la même façon que dans le TOC, de supprimer ces, cette, cette, ces préoccupations euh, intrusives liées à la prise d'alcool, eh bien, il n'y a qu'un pas que je ne franchirai pas, mais qui me donne envie quand même d'essayer ça. J'ai regardé également le, 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 ce que faisait la High Frequency Deep Brain Stimulation. Il y a quand même un certain nombre d'études qui, maintenant, vont, proposent à des patients souffrant d'alcool, souffrant de dépendance à la cocaïne, l'utilisation de la stimulation cérébrale profonde, avec là, ici, quand même, des limites, malheureusement, qui sont liées aux limites du device, du matériel qui est utilisé, qui est un matériel avec fil, c'est-à-dire qu'aujourd'hui, pour stimuler électriquement des électrodes situées au niveau du noyau subthalamique, au niveau du striatum ventral, eh bien, vous êtes obligé d'utiliser euh, des, des stimulations électriques qui sont connectées à une batterie qui se situe à l'extérieur de l'organisme. Donc on attend évidemment, avec beaucoup d'impatience, soit, soit une espèce de, de micro pile ou de micro batterie qui serait connectée aux électrodes de stimulation, soit évidemment d'autres types de stimulations comme les ultrasons qui pourraient améliorer euh, ces techniques-là. Voilà, j'ai juste pour vous dire que, euh, me semble-t-il, aujourd'hui, ces techniques de neurostimulation doivent se développer dans le champ des addictions. Euh, j'espère euh, vous avoir, euh, en tout cas, euh, j'espère avoir attisé votre curiosité. Quelques éléments quand même juste complémentaires. La neuroplasticité induite par la RTMS dépendrait de l'activation du cerveau au moment de la stimulation. Et il me semble essentiel, comme cela a été montré d'ailleurs par les études qui aujourd'hui sont présentées par le laboratoire Brainsway, de pouvoir sensibiliser l'individu à la problématique de dépendance à laquelle il est soumis. Et euh, plusieurs études d'enregistrement cellulaire ont montré que les circuits cérébraux sont d'autant plus prêts à changer lorsqu'ils se trouvent en période de décharge électrique. Et ça, c'est un aspect essentiel à trouver avant de, que nous mettions euh, euh, en place euh, l'utilisation de ce type de technique. Voilà, je voulais, je voulais juste essayer de vous sensibiliser à cette, à cette continuité des symptômes qui existent entre les pathologies du spectre obsessionnel compulsif et les pathologies addictives, le parasitage de la pensée, les défauts de prise de décision avec le délai de discounting, 
la compulsivité, la compulsivité, je vous rappelle la, la définition, une tendance à accomplir des actes de manière répétée et habituelle pour éviter les conséquences négatives perçues, bien que l'acte lui-même puisse entraîner des conséquences négatives. Et les conséquences pour le TOC, mais encore plus pour les addictions, sont sévères, comme j'ai pu l'illustrer au cours de ces quelques minutes. Voilà, ça c'est l'équipe de recherche de l'ICRIN, de l'infrastructure clinique de recherche en neurosciences de l'Institut du cerveau que je coordonne à Paris, à la pitié salpêtrière en articulation avec l'hôpital Saint-Antoine, et nous travaillons notamment sur des problématiques de ce type-là. Je vous remercie de votre attention. Merci de ta présentation. Euh, en attendant que certains réfléchissent à une question à poser éventuelle, moi j'en aurai une en, en deux temps à te poser. La, la première, je reviendrai sur le, le modèle du TOC. Et, et je me souviens, vous, vous écoutant, spécialiste de la, de la DBS pour le TOC, euh, dans des discussions euh, âpres mais toujours amicales et sympathiques sur le choix de la cible, où on était avec, dans le cas de la simulation cérébrale profonde, avec une, une précision, j'aurais tendance à dire une ultra précision de stimulation. Et les premières études, dont aucune n'a donné d'approbation FDA ou autre pour le TOC avec la RTMS, avec des bobines qui étaient assez focales, avaient différents choix de, de, de cibles qui étaient répartis entre le l'air motrice supplémentaire, le cortex préfrontal, autre, avec, avec des enfin, peut-être pas des discussions aussi aptes, mais, mais une discussion sur le, sur le choix de la cible. A ton avis, le fait qu'on ait un outil comme le H7, qui va effectivement cibler de façon contemporaine un, un certain nombre de cibles simultanément, est-ce que c'est une partie de la solution ou est-ce que ça n'a rien à voir avec ça Alors. Euh, c'est en tout cas euh, l'argument qui est donné par Brainsway en disant ben, on va stimuler euh, plus de cibles neuroanatomiques euh, pour avoir un effet plus performant. Ça, c'est la logique de, 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 de l'entreprise pour ce qui me concerne. Et autant dans la stimulation cérébrale profonde que dans la RTMS, je pense que plus on est précis dans la cible que l'on va localiser, et plus nous allons trouver des thérapeutiques qui soient adéquates. Autrement dit, si, alors, c'est-à-dire qu'il va falloir de plus en plus à la fois personnaliser la stimulation, c'est la raison pour laquelle d'ailleurs nous avons développé un neuronavigateur, et c'est aussi la raison pour laquelle on insiste beaucoup sur la nécessité, lorsqu'on le peut, d'utiliser un, un neuronavigateur. Donc je dirais que... La force aujourd'hui de Brainsway, ce n'est pas la localisation précise de la cible, c'est sa capacité en tant qu'outil électromagnétique d'aller plus en profondeur euh, vers les structures sous-corticales. Et ça, aujourd'hui, c'est la seule technique qui puisse permettre justement d'aller en sous-cortical. L'autre technique, évidemment, c'est la technique de stimulation cérébrale profonde à haute fréquence, mais celle-là, c'est une technique invasive. Et aujourd'hui, pour des patients qui euh, présentent euh, quand même... Enfin, c'est pas si simple que ça de proposer une intervention chirurgicale à des patients souffrant de troubles obsessionnels compulsifs, voire même d'addiction, parce que l'on sait que beaucoup d'autres facteurs vont leur permettre d'arrêter ça. Donc, euh, moi, je plaide pour une précision la plus importante de la cible neuroanatomique, pour, ce, pour que l'on soit le plus précis sur ce que nous faisons avec nos patients. Merci, merci pour ta réponse. Y a-t-il d'autres questions dans la salle Sinon, tu, tu m'as donné la, la transition toute faite d'un inventeur à l'autre. Alors, Bruno Millet est, est <coughs> fondateur d'une société Cineica qui, effectivement a mis au point et commercialise un neuronavigateur et euh, le professeur Abraham Zangen qui euh, est inventeur euh, du concept du H-Coil et euh, qui est actuellement professeur de neurosciences à l'université Ben Gurion euh, a aussi beaucoup travaillé euh, à la fois euh, sur le TOC et aussi sur les addictions et le parallèle effectivement euh, il, il est existant et c'est vrai que c'est avec les, les H-Coil 
que euh, le, le plus grand nombre d'approbations FDA sur ces, dernières, euh, sur, ces, sur, ces, sur ces derniers temps a eu lieu, euh, notamment dans le TOC, l'addiction au tabac. Et, 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 et on s'attend tous, après le dernier congrès de Brain Simulation à Lisbonne, que la, la prochaine approbation FDA soit sur, sur l'addiction à l'alcool. Donc, du coup, je laisse la parole au professeur Abraham Sangen. Encore merci de, de votre participation à ce, à ce séminaire cet après-midi. Hello, uh, everyone. Do you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, we hear you. Okay. So, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to this uh, conference, and I'm really sorry for not being able to attend in person due to due to the situation in in Israel. I will talk uh, about uh, the development of uh, brain stimulation uh, to the treatment of addiction and the uh, talk about the history, uh, starting from animal studies that we have uh, been doing uh, for 15 years and still doing now to understand better mechanisms of how brain stimulation can change the neuropathology in animal models of addiction and uh, how this was eventually developed into a, a regulatory approval, FDA approval uh, for addiction uh, in the smoking field. And I'll tell you also about uh, new studies that are Uh, just being uh, now going to be published about the effects of stimulation on neuronal connectivity in humans uh, and al alcoholic uh, patients uh, to try and understand better the mechanism of how multiple sessions of brain stimulation can affect the neuropathology of alcoholism as well. So, first of all, just about the theory that we first uh, Uh, put uh, forward in 2007 in an animal study, the idea that brain stimulation can change uh, pathological circuitry in addiction uh, was actually inspired by someone else. Uh, uh, his name is Bill Carlson. I was working at that time at the National Institute of uh, Health in the NIDA, National Institute on, on, on Drug Abuse. Uh, with Roy Wise. He was like the deputy director of the place. And his former postdoctoral fellow, uh, Bill Carlison, showed uh, before I came there that uh, when you do brain stimulation reward, if you, you just implant electrodes into rats and do you know, brain stimulation rewards, what rats would lever press to stimulate themselves uh, because it produces very strong rewarding effect. And then if you look at the molecular changes, in these animal models, some of them are actually opposite from the molecular changes that are induced by various addictions and particularly cocaine exposure. So this inspired the idea of perhaps if we stimulate the brain reward system repeatedly, we might induce uh, opposite effects of what the addiction process is in inducing over time and thereby maybe change addictive behaviors. So this was the idea when I came back uh, and established my, uh, my lab at the Weizmann Institute in Israel. I came back from my postdoctoral fellowship after four years in the United States. We started this uh, study. And uh, if you really want to know more about possible mechanisms of brain stimulation altogether, not just in addiction, we wrote a, a very comprehensive review about this, uh, several reviews that you can look here how, uh, what underlying mechanisms can, can, can cause uh, long-term changes in excitability or synaptic plasticity and even myelin plasticity. I will talk about this a little bit at the end of this talk, how we show by uh, diffusion tensor imaging uh, myelin plasticity even induced in alcoholic patients uh, when we get to the end of my talk. Um, Another concept that I must introduce in this, uh, in this talk is that, uh, that prior to stimulation, if we activate the relevant brain networks using provocation, uh, like cue-induced memory recall in post-traumatic stress disorder, or in the case of addiction, we induce the craving. If we activate the pathological circuitry of, in OCD, if we activate the obsessions, then we are more likely to affect the pathological circuitry because it's known from basic science studies, many of them, even in our neural cultures, that uh, stimulation can change the circuitry 
of multiple neurons when the circuitry is active. When it's resting, it's less likely to induce la long lasting effects. So in order to really change the circuitry, you need to activate it and then it's more liable for change. It's easier to change it when it's active. It's like easier to change a memory after you recall it, right? You can't change the memory of something without recalling it first. So these are the issues that are as an introduction for my talk. And of course, I need to mention in the case of addiction, the areas that are most, uh, you know, repeatedly in many studies showing uh, to be activated in uh, response to cues that are uh, causing craving. So any for various addictions, cocaine, alcohol, smoking, or any addiction, heroin, we always see uh, either the insula or the medial prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate cortex as areas that are activated uh, in functional MRI studies uh, following a presentation of drug use that are correlated with the increase of craving in, in the patients. Okay, so now going back to the animal studies, just as the, uh, from the history, that's the first study we did, we used a very simple model in rats, which is called the psychomotor sensitization model, where uh, when you uh, inject rats, uh, cocaine or amphetamine repeatedly. And then uh, after two weeks, like say we, you, you, you inject it for one week um, in a certain dose, and then you leave them at the home cage and you can take them back after one or two or three weeks and test the effect of the same dose of cocaine or amphetamine. And you see a sensitization, increased response to the same drug. Uh, so we know that multiple sessions of uh, most drugs cause actually tolerance, but the sensitization in the psychomotor effect is a very interesting phenomenon, particularly in stimulants. You see like increased motor response to the drug after multiple sessions. Now, we use this model in order to check uh, whether 10 days of stimulation using the TMS-like patterns of stimulation in rats. So here it's implanted electrodes using the same patterns of temporal patterns of stimulation like with TMS, 10 Hertz or, or higher frequencies in trains, every day 15 minutes of treatment, and then test whether the psychomotor sensitization, simple motor effect is attenuated, changed. And we also checked these brains and looked for this uh, uh, biological measures like the AMPA receptor, the GLUA1 particular, which is interesting because it, uh, uh, more, the, the more GLUA1 you have, the more penetration to calcium. But let's look first at the behavioral effect. And here, when the stimulation was applied for 10 days in the lateral hypothalamus, that's where you have brain stimulation reward most effective in rats when they press the lever to stimulate themselves. So we treat them 10 days in that brain reward center, the for brain, uh, brain stimulation reward. And what we see is actually that those that were treated with active stimulation versus sham, the sham was just implanted electrode, but with zero current, no real stimulation in the rats. So we see that the sensitization is higher. Actually, we induced a greater psychomotor response to the same cocaine drug. These two groups here are seeing cocaine for the first time, active or sham. Uh, stimulation, but they see it for the first time. These are two groups are pre-treated with cocaine for a week. So after two weeks, we put them back in the, into, the, uh, into the test. We inject the cocaine. So this is a psychomotor response. Of course, it's a stimulant. These are rats that are addicted already, higher response, but those that received 10 days of stimulation had greater psychomotor response. That means actually we didn't improve their addiction. We actually caused deterioration. So this is going against any you know, idea of treatment. It's actually sensitized their response to the cocaine. However, when the elect was implanted into the prefrontal cortex, not the lateral hypothalamus, where there's many fibers of passage in the, of the reward system, when it went just to the prefrontal cortex, then we got an opposite effect, where the active stimulation attenuated, reduced the response to cocaine versus the sham. 
So here we have already a signal that maybe a prefrontal cortex is a good target for stimulation, 10 days of stimulation using TMS-like patterns in a rat model. This was also accompanied by some interesting changes in the biochemistry as we measured by in the nucleus accumbens, particularly in the anterior part of the nucleus accumbens shell and the anterior part of the ventral tegmental area, where we found changes that are opposite uh, in the areas in the rats that were receiving the active treatment versus the shunt treatment relative to what happens during the addiction process in these proteins uh, in these brain areas. Now, a more intuitive model is just using rats that can lever press. They press a lever to stimulate themselves. We uh, implant uh, an electrode to the brain, but also into the jugular vein where there is a cannula each time the rat presses the lever, it activates this pump and they become addicted to cocaine. And each time they press the lever, also there is a light and a tone. So there is some Pavlovian association and the rats learn very fast to lever press for cocaine. Now the question is now in the test, when we remove cocaine from the syringe after 10 days of stimulation, the same patterns of 10 days, it's two weeks. When I say 10 days, I mean five days per week for two weeks, 10 sessions of half hour per day of treatment with an implanted electrode, are they going to increase their cocaine seeking behavior or decrease it? So what we see here in both groups of rats, both implanted with electrode into the lateral hypothalamus or the prefrontal cortex, we find a reduction in their cocaine seeking behavior. So we attenuated the cocaine seeking behavior when cocaine is not on board in the test day. After they become addicted, we test how much they press for cocaine. But a different type of test where they do have cocaine in the, in the, in the syringe, but we test their motivation to consume the cocaine by what we call the progressive ratio schedule. That means that each time for another cocaine dose, they need to press more times the lever. So for the first dose, they press once. For the second dose, they already need to press three times. For the third dose, 10 times. And it goes up to 200 times uh, of lever press just for a single cocaine dose. And they sometimes just stop, they are pissed off, they are not willing to work so hard for just one cocaine injection. And what we measure here is how much they are willing to work for cocaine in the progressive ratio test. And here again, when the electrode was implanted to the lateral hypothalamus, there was a sensitization. Actually, they were willing to press more, up to 250, more than 250 times, just for one cocaine injection relative to the sham. But when the treatment was performed into the prefrontal cortex for 10 days, then again, we did receive a reduction in the motivation for cocaine. So we already have two indications from two different behavioral measures in rats that prefrontal cortex is a good target for stimulation using TMS-like patterns with implanted electrode, like with DBS, but not a constant stimulation, just half hour per day. Now, the final slide I will show you in animals is new, much newer. It's a, it's a new study in my lab. Uh, there are many studies since then, but I want to highlight just a few uh, uh, findings from this study. It's a more complicated model for addiction where we test relapse of the rats. So here the rats are trained to lever press just like before, but we then introduce an electrical barrier next to the lever. So there is a safe zone in the cage, but the red, in order to receive the, ne the, the cocaine to, to, to press the lever, they have to go over an electrical barrier. So first we train the reds without any electrical barrier, but after we introduce the electrical barrier, we can find for each red, what is the intensity of the shock that will cause the red to stay in the safe zone and avoid the cocaine, like the, the the red say, I can pay $50 for cocaine, but not uh, $500. Okay, so for each red, we find this threshold of what intensity will make the red uh, abstinent and decide I, I'm stopping to be addicted and stay here for half hour during the session without even going once. Now, after we find this abstinence threshold for each red, we, uh, we induce 
the Q-induced craving, we put the light and the tone associated with cocaine, okay? I forgot to tell you, when they are trained, they receive the light and the tone. So we flash the light above the lever, we produce the tone, and then what we see is relapse. The rat goes back over the electrical barrier and press for cocaine. So we, here we have a, mod a model to measure relapse. Now the question is whether we can prevent this relapse by TMS or by, in this case, implanted electrode using TMS-like patterns of stimulation in the brain. And we target the prefrontal cortex in two areas, the prelimbic or the infralimbic, that's more superficial, that's more deep into the prefrontal cortex of the rat. And we see behaviorally that we could induce relapse rates. This is the sham. Relapse rate is over 80%. In the prelimbic cortex treatment for 10 days, we get a reduction, which is not significant. In the infralimbic, which is deeper layers of the prefrontal cortex, which have more projections to the nucleus accumbens and other reward areas, then we do get a, a very significant reduction in relapse rates. In this case, we also had electrophysiological measures. It's a more complicated study where the electrode can allow you to measure activity in the brain during the sessions. Uh, we don't have single units here, but at least local field potentials found, tell us a little bit about the mechanisms of, of what's happening here. If we measure the power of the, the delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma waves uh, during the session with the light and the tone when they have the craving versus a session that uh, has no light and tone, we can measure how this Q-induced craving change the activity in the brain. And basically, I will just tell you that in this group that was effective in the infralimbic group, we see that there is an increase during the session when the cue and the tone is presented in the low uh, waves, like in delta, theta, and alpha waves are increased in their power. This actually indicates reduction in activity in the infralimbic cortex because of the stimulation. So our stimulation was able to reduce activity in, the, uh, in this deep uh, prefrontal cortex areas. And this reduction of activity, or at least increasing the low uh, wave powers, uh, is maybe associated with the reduction in addictive behavior or the reduction of relapse. So this is what we have so far in the animals that I wanted to show you now the translation of all these studies to humans. So the first uh, study we did in humans actually was before we had uh, the approval for this specific age coil, the deep TMS coil. Uh, we used a simple figure eight coil in smokers. It's much easier to recruit smokers. So we wanted to translate our animal work, original animal work in the humans with say, smoking addiction. Uh, so we had uh, subjects that uh, were trying to quit smoking and failed previous attempts, we used the same frequency that we found to be effective with implanted electrodes in the red, 10 hertz daily sessions for, se for, for several weeks. And we measured both subjective report of how much cigarettes you take, objective, uh, it's also important always to take urine samples and measure cotinine, which is a metabolite of, of um, nicotine. And we had this provocation of symptoms. In the red, the provocation is there, but let's leave the reds here. Now we are doing the provocation by producing, showing them smoking pictures or later videos that are provoking the craving for the cigarette. So we had in the sham group, we had either neutral pictures or smoking pictures with or without provocation. Also in the real group with or without provocation. So these are four groups two basic groups, active and sham stimulation, but also looking for the effectiveness of provocation. How will this affect the treatment? So 10 days of treatment, just like what we did in the reds, and four groups of subjects. And here is the self-report. You see before an average 30 cigarettes, a pack and a half in a day in these uh, subjects is reduced in all groups, both receiving sham or active stimulation. No matter if they had cues or no had cues, like if they have the provocation or not, it was a very disappointing result altogether, although it looks like with those, with the active uh, treatment together with the provocation, we had the best 
reduction, but it's not very significant. Altogether, we see very nice reduction because these are all subjects that are motivated to stop uh, smoking. They come and after 10 days, they smoke less, fine, but no difference between the groups. However, when you look at the urine samples, look at the quaternion levels, you see that actually it's only the active groups, those receiving real stimulation, reduced quaternion levels in their urine. So this is a very interesting, you know, uh, conflict or discrepancy between what they report and what you measure in the urine. One of the explanations for this, you know, they are all motivated, they are coming 10 days and being very involved in the study and therefore they were, there's a wishful thinking that they actually reduced uh, smoking. But the other explanation that we found is probably, uh, it's not just like self-deceit of, of themselves, they are not lying to themselves and to us. I think it's not just that, it's also that we, we learned from a few examples that subjects are, even in the sham group, they are really smoking less cigarettes, but they smoke it much more to the end. They inhale more, so they less smoke cigarettes, but each cigarette they smoke all the way to the end. They inhale much more. So altogether, the cotton in the urine is not really reduced, although they smoke less cigarettes. In the active group, it was really a reduction. The only problem in this study was that there was no quitting. There was just a reduction in the number of cigarettes. The problem we know is that after some time, if you just reduce the number of cigarettes and you don't quit altogether, you will eventually go up to the, to the original level of your smoking. And after uh, six months of follow-up, there was no difference between all the, the three groups at all. So this was with the figure of eight coil. At that time, then we already developed the deep TMS coils to affect also the insula and much deeper into the prefrontal cortex. And here uh, we see that, uh, and, uh, so we had a, a new study with uh, uh, active or sham stimulation with or without the cues. So we see here with or without the cues for sham. In this case, we added also one Hertz low frequency of stimulation and the 10 Hertz. So we had altogether six groups and you see that the reduction was very nice in the 10 hertz group, particularly when you have it in combination with the cues. This is now when you have a deep TMS coil, H4 coil targeting both the prefrontal cortex and the insula. And the cotinine levels also here, sorry, this is the cotinine levels. This is what you see here is the self report. So the red group is again, the 10 hertz plus the cues had the best reduction. And most important here that we did get some quitting, particularly in this group receiving the 10 Hertz, not in the one Hertz, the 10 Hertz stimulation together with the cues, although there was a reduction also without the cues. So there was some advantage to adding the provocation, but there was some effect also without it. And if you look at the quitting rate, complete quitting zero cigarettes after three weeks, you see it most important, most you know robust, in this group receiving the 10 Hertz, uh, just as we had in the reds, right? 10 Hertz and uh, half, um, and, uh, less than half hour per day altogether. And then we see close to 40% uh, quitting. And after six uh, months, this is only by far not by cutting in measures, we still see this group, uh, you know, very salient, the 10 Hertz plus the provocation. So this study that was published in biological psychiatry was the basis for a multi-center study. We took these results and said, now let's do a large study with many centers around the world and see whether active versus sham stimulation will be effective. Just taking the 10 Hertz with the provocation versus sham with the provocation and see the effects. And these are different centers around the world that was involved in the study together with Mark George in the United States. We had two groups, 10 Hertz and Sham. So active and Sham with both of them with provocation, smoking exposure procedure. And uh, we had 12 sites all together in this study and recruited 427 subjects uh, eligible starting really enrolled is 262. Uh, subjects, heavy smokers, look at this, there are 27 years or 26 years in average of smokers, very heavy smokers that tried to quit several times and failed 
different medications or gum. Uh, so 60% of them failed at least three attempts to, to stop smoking. So these are heavy smokers for many years that were not able to stop smoking by simple, you know, means of drugs, medications, or anything else. In average, they had all, uh, about a pack per day, 18 cigarettes per day in both the active and the sham group. And here we tested in a multicenter study with FDA regulation the, whether we can replicate our original biological psychiatry paper. And indeed, the results were positive and led to FDA clearance for the H4 coil targeting prefrontal cortex and insula uh, in smoking addiction. Although if you look at the results, they are not very, you know, not uh, very promising. They are very good in terms of active versus sham. You see the difference is very clear in any measure. If you look at the ITT or completers, the short-term effect after three months, and this is always caught in measures, with objective measures. So you see very clear difference between the active stimulation and the sham in this multicenter study. But the rates are not very great, right? You see here about 25%. That's, uh, that's uh, basically the amount of patients that really were quitting for uh, three months, three months plus the original three weeks uh, they, they had four uh, uh, grace period in the first two weeks. So we're talking about three, three and a half months of quitting. Uh, and this was very clearly different between active and sham. And the continuous abstinence is very nicely, uh, you know, presenting just those who are uh, not touching a cigarette, even a, 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 a one cigarette is already considered relapse. So we're talking about complete clean uh, subjects complete quitting, and this led to the FDA approval, and this is already an, uh, 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 um, an existing treatment in many countries, and um, maybe soon will even be reimbursed in the United States, just like for depression. Most interesting in this study was that we were able to predict who is going to quit and who is not going to predict, uh, to quit uh, in a post hoc analysis, of the craving measures. We had a craving measure, which is very interesting. We had different types of craving measure, but the most simple one was how much do you want a cigarette right now? And so we did it in a visual analog, or analog scale. Uh, before we have a baseline, how much you want a cigarette, then we do a Q induced uh, craving and ask him how much you want a cigarette now. Then we do the stimulation. So we have one, two, and three uh, visual analog scales questionnaire. And you see that, of course, the Q-induced uh, craving produce, so the second is after the Q-induced craving produces some, some craving. And then after the stimulation, in average, those receiving active stimulation had a, re uh, had a reduced uh, craving relative to the sham. So both of them, because of the time, has a reduction, but relative to baseline, we see that those receiving the active stimulation are lower in their craving versus the sham. But interestingly, what we predict, we find in the prediction here is that we can, based on the reduction of craving following the stimulation, we know in the first session already who is going to quit or not for some, you know, not, not one by one, but for very significant uh, level of prediction. So the greater the effect on craving was in the first session, the greater chances for the subject to be a quitter after three weeks of treatment as measured uh, by the cotinin and objective measures. And here you just see that the reduction in craving at baseline in the first visual scale is, is true also for the sham group, but is stronger for the active group. Uh, three weeks, every day you see a reduction in the craving, but again, in the first session already, the reduction in craving following active treatment can predict the quitting of the particular subject. This was a very interesting finding as we published in World Psychiatry 2021. Now, the last uh, topic that I'm uh, talk about is now the more, uh, you know, the newer studies we are doing in alcohol addiction. So this is done in together in collaboration also with Marcus Helig in Sweden. He was based, um, 
previously the clinical director of, neuro of uh, uh, alcoholism uh, in the United States in, in NIH. And uh, so this was a consortium that we had uh, uh, sponsored by, by uh, Horizon in 2020. Uh, and uh, we tested both the uh, coil that is targeting the insula, particularly the insula, not prefrontal cortex in insula, but more directly to the insula and some of the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex, but also not the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, it's the H8 coil. It's not the H4 coil that we had for smoking versus the H7 coil, which is the one we, you heard about and is using, used for OCD treatment, already gained FDA approval for OCD treatment. So we tested two different sites, the same protocol in those studies, two different sites of stimulation, the same type of protocols as we had in the smoking, just other targets in the brain. And uh, these are the numbers, these are two different studies. We had uh, uh, alcoholic uh, subjects uh, that are wishing to, 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 to you know, to, to stop uh, drinking. Uh, we had exposure to alcohol cues in both of them. The t same 10 hertz uh, sessions uh, and 20 minutes uh, treatment per day with uh, 3,000 pulses. And then we followed them up for three months to see how much of them relapse. Of course, many of them will reduce their drinking as always in these studies. The question is whether they can maintain uh, without uh, drinking. So we also have urine samples and biological sampling to have objective measures of whether they are uh, really uh, stopping, uh, they stopped the drinking for those who, who uh, report that. So these are the two studies. And again, with the smoking cues, they always are, we are pouring the alcoholic beverage that they like into the glass. In front of them, they smell it, they can't drink it. We put it on the table in front of them along the session. So they have this strong provocation during the session every day while they get stimulated with either the age eight or the age seven coil. So here are the results for the age eight coil, which were published in neuropsychopharmacology. And we see very disappointing results. Of course, there is a reduction in the heavy drinking days. What we measure is the percentage of heavy drinking days. So there is a reduction. They are all motivated to stop, but this is gradually going up through the 12 weeks and three months of follow-up, and there is no difference between active or sham. On the other hand, with the H7 coil, that the one that was approved for OCD, this one did show a separation between active and sham. You see this reduction again, just like what we had in the insula study. In the medial prefrontal cortex HCC H7 coil, we see also again this strong reduction in heavy drinking days following the three weeks of treatment. And then this is still down in the active group, but it's going up, up, and up through during the three uh, months. As uh, we have altogether five follow ups, this is three months five, and five visits, a uh, gradual increase in the heavy drinking days in the sham group. And this separation is still statistically significant. Uh, also, if you just measure the craving, you see a reduction and then up again, but in the active group of the H7 coil, we see that it remains to be lower relative to the sham, particularly in the three months. So this is the three months follow-up. This is during the three weeks of stimulation itself. There is clearly a reduction in craving as they reported in the uh, pen alcohol craving scale, the PAX. So the PAX shows the reduction in both active and sham group, but this is continued to be re reduced, reduced during the three weeks of stimulation and even for three months, it's basically not going up very strongly in the group, but in the sham group, it's gradually uh, increasing the craving. So this is going together with the behavior and the amount of alcohol they drink. Here you see the grams in grams, how many, uh, how much alcohol per gram per week they drink. And you see the sham versus the active group during the three months of follow-up, 12 weeks, is lower in the active versus the sham group. So we have a good signal here that targeting the uh, prefrontal cortex, media prefrontal cortex, and, 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 uh, and anterior cingulate cortex as a positive site for treatment of alcoholism, not the H8 call with the, uh, with the um, insular targeting. 
So we also had the question how much we really engage the target in this uh, insula, because there's a lot of evidence that insula is involved in alcohol addiction. And based on functional MRI studies uh, that we did in the same subjects, the same alcoholic subjects, we measured them before and after the three weeks of the treatment. And what you see here clearly is that there is target engagement. We do see a difference between the sham and the active TMS. Here we just look at uh, the, the connectivity between the insula and some other brain regions like left preconeus or uh, right cingulate gyros. And you do see <clears throat> that with the active group is the versus the sham group, you see changes in connectivity, which indicates that we did affect, we did, we were able to target the, the insula, uh, but without any efficacy in terms of clinical outcomes, craving or clinical uh, outcomes of alcohol, heavy drinking days in the uh, subjects receiving active uh, versus the sham. In the case of the uh, H7 coil targeting the anterior cingulate and, uh, and, 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 and medial prefrontal cortex, uh, we see changes in connectivity uh, in the active group, which is actually showing reduction in connectivity between the medial prefrontal cortex and subgenual anterior cingulate cortex, a reduction, while in the sham group there is a tendency for increase during the three weeks of treatment. So we just compare baseline and after three weeks in the fMRI connectivity. So we see that there is a reduction in the active group in the connectivity, in functional connectivity. Also between the uh, dorsal uh, dorsal part of the anterior cingulate cortex and the caudate uh, nucleus, there's also a uh, reduction in the active group uh, relative to what we see in the sham group during these three weeks. So we have two biological changes that are induced following three weeks of treatment, which might be associated with the clinical effectiveness of this uh, manipulation. The last thing, which is not yet published, that I will just tell you briefly because of the time, is about what we learned, and this is not published yet, uh, from the data on the DTI, diffusion tensor imaging from the same study. Just one note as an introduction, we know from diffusion tensor imaging that there is a, a reduction in fractional anisotropy uh, following alcohol withdrawal. So during alcohol withdrawal, and even during alcoholism altogether, there is some decrease in fractional anisotropy, which means reduction in connectivity, reduction in, in myelin uh, uh, in, in, in many areas of the brain, okay? And this is also true in, in animal models. We know it also from alcohol drinking rates. There is a reduction in fractional anisotropy, which is indicating uh, some myelin problems in, in the brain, some uh, loss of connectivity between regions, okay? Now, uh, we were able to replicate these findings in our study, showing without even connection between, you know, active or sham, we see that between the first... Ab Abraham, so, the, sorry, two, two minutes left. Would you mind to, to conclude, please? Yes, Thank I, you I, will do, I will do it in, in, in one and a half minutes. So just we see we can replicate these findings showing that there is a... A, a reduction in fractional anisotropy, which is uh, uh, also was suggested to be related to contribute uh, to relapse vulnerability. And the finding in the active versus sham is again very interesting. From the area of stimulation in the prefrontal cortex, this uh, you know, reduction in myelin plasticity in the sham group was arrested and prevented by deep TMS. So deep TMS actually was able to restore or to avoid the reduction in, uh, you know, myelin plasticity uh, following three weeks of treatment. So this is now indicating another mechanism by which the repetitive stimulation can uh, change the, you know, pathology of of the uh, of alcohol addiction. I will skip this and just go to the conclusion slide. So what we learned is that why the H4 coil targeting the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and insula is effective in smoking addiction and was also FDA approved. It has no support for efficacy of the H8 coil targeting the insula for alcohol use disorder. 
maybe the explanation is that there is no uh, enough stimulation of the uh, stimulation of the insula. Not all of it is involved in the stimulation. It's very hard to really stimulate much of the insula with even with the age eight coil. Another uh, explanation could be that we need the dorsal prefrontal cortex together with the insula together in order to affect addiction, at least as we found in the smoking study. But there is a very positive, promising signal in terms of H7 cord targeting the medial prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate cortex for alcohol addiction. And uh, we hope to, to replicate it in a multicenter study, just like we were able to do with the H4 coil for smoking. And uh, hopefully we will establish also a good treatment for alcoholism with regulatory approvals as we already have signals in a nice uh, study with more than 50 subjects and some indications of replication of this in some group that we, uh, we, we are collaborating with. I want to thank all the people involved in these different studies, including Mark George in the smoking study, Marcus Haley um, uh, in the uh, alcohol studies, Santiago, uh, Santiago Canaz uh, is the DTI expert, and uh, all my group uh, and other people that I collaborate with. And thank you for listening. Sorry for taking a little bit uh, longer. And uh, that's it. Thank you. Merci pour cette présentation très intéressante. J'aurais deux courtes questions, je, je, éventuellement si la salle a une question. J'aurais une question technique qu'on a déjà un peu abordée il y a quelques années. Nous étions à Royan. Euh, une autre façon de faire de la deep TMS, c'est avec un double cone coil, un, un, une bobine en double cone. Par contre, euh, en termes de confort, c'est très différent. Euh, la, la, la bobine en double cone est, est, est assez douloureuse à des intensités thérapeutiques. Qu comment expliquer très simplement le, le confort avec la H-Coil So can you translate? I, I think I, I guess what you asked, but if you can translate it to English. Oh, yes. Um, I, I, I already uh, asked you several years again. Uh, you, you can do tip TMS with uh, double coil, coil, but it's painful. Or, yes. or do you explain simply uh, why ice coil is comfortable? Yes. So first of all, uh, it's important to say that uh, with the double coin coil, you cannot reach as deep as much as you can with the H coil. The, and the main reason for the different uh, in pain is that uh, in the case of the double corn coil, there is an intersection between the two uh, you know, loops, which produces a strong field and at the intersection. And then this field decays over the distance and therefore you need a high intensity to reach deeper. In the H coil, the structure is much more distributed. The whole, whole idea of the H coil is that you stimulate larger volume by distributing the wires in the structure of the coil, and therefore there is no local high intensity on the scalp. In one point, it's more distributed around the scalp, and therefore you both can reach deeper and it's also less painful because you reach the target from different angles around the scalp. So altogether, it's also deeper. It's stimulating larger volume, which might be sometimes a disadvantage for uh, research purposes, but for clinical use so far, we also know in depression that this larger volume of stimulation is less focal. Uh, it's also more effective in uh, depression. Thank you. So my second. Est-ce qu'il oh, y a d'autres des questions? Uh, maybe one question, uh, Abraham. Uh, when you say that, if, if I understand well, the 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 H call which works in uh, with rival tobacco is the the one which targets uh, insula, but not. Uh, CP, uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. So how do you explain this discrepancy between you both results, between uh, the H4 and the H, and the H8 uh, in that sense? Yes, so uh, I, I just want to make it more accurate. The H4 
is targeting the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex and the insula, okay? This is a very large coil producing stimulation of both dorsal lateral on the way to the insula. On the other hand, the H8 coil that was used in the alcohol study was designed following, uh, you know, the consultation with Marcus Heilig to avoid the stimulation of the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex in order to study more direct targeting just of the insula. And this was the one who failed. So the explanation we may have is that we need probably the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex as part of the circuitry to affect in order to get a clinical outcome. And if you avoid the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, you only stimulate the insula, as we did in the alcohol, is not enough. It's probably the, the answer. The other option is because the insula is very deep, we are only stimulating the part of it. We don't, based on our uh, 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 the field maps that we measure in phantom brain, we can see that we can reach the insula only towards about a third of it, not the full capacity of the whole insula. So these may be the two reasons we can explain why it did not work in alcohol, but it did work in, in uh, nicotine addiction. There is also another explanation, of course, that alcohol addiction and smoking addiction uh, has some differences, although in both cases we do measure craving, we see the effect on craving, but uh, maybe there is some differences in the circuitries why the H4 maybe could have been effective, uh, uh, not effective even in, in, in uh, alcoholism. So there are many reasons to explain the discrepancy between the two studies, but what we have a signal for sure is actually with the H7 coil, right, in alcoholism. Does it mean that that will be the last question? Does it mean that uh, the, the more precise, the more accurate you are in the, uh, in the targeting of the, of the neuroanatomic uh, structure, the, 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 the best results you obtain? Uh, is it your position? Uh, I don't, well, no, <laughs> I, I don't think so. Actually, no. actually, actually, my position is that you need to to, uh, to affect a very large circuitry and repeatedly every day in order to make a change because the brain is much more elastic than plastic. It will always go back to, you know, baseline. And in order to make a change, you need something more like an ECT, an electroconvulsive, you know, treatment like type of approach. You, you don't, you never get an effect in depression with one session of ECT. You need multiple sessions of ECT stimulating the whole brain. So you need to target larger volumes uh, and many nodes in the circuitry in order to induce a lasting change following multiple sessions. So being very accurate and specific in your targeting may be interesting for research, but for a clinical outcome, you actually need to stimulate larger volumes and more parts of the nodes involved in the pathology. Okay, thank you very much, Abraham, and I wish you all the best because I know that in Israel uh, the, the time is difficult, and uh, so we wish all, all the best to your nation and to you all the citizens. Okay. Thank you very thank much. Now we welcome the last speaker, who is Dr. Uh, Derek Blevins, who works in New York. He is professor assistant at Columbia University. He is an addictologist and a psychiatrist. Euh, contrairement à nous, et euh, son domaine de recherche euh, de prédilection, c'est la RTMS des addictions. Il va nous parler effectivement du sujet de l'addiction de la cocaïne et de la RTMS. Merci. I didn't have my translator on, so hopefully he said good things about me. Um, but uh, thank you for both of the, the previous presentations. Uh, they were excellent. I don't know if it makes my job easier or harder, but I will be optimistic and say easier. So I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about some of the evidence of using TMS for cocaine addiction, um, the evidence that exists so far, and then um, uh, some potential future applications, um, including a, a grant that, uh, or a study we have funded but have not yet started. So some of the objectives, so some of the theoretical basis, which I will go through a little bit more quickly to make up time, and since it's been covered in the previous two talks, the evidence to date for TMS for cocaine use disorder, cocaine addiction, and then finally, the possible future of TMS in cocaine addiction treatment. 
So this was an image that um, the first presenter showed that uh, talks about the different circuits involved in addiction or substance use disorders. Um, and I think it's a helpful thing to think about when we're looking at potential targets, uh, TMS targets, to treat addiction. Um, of course, the, the three elements of this circuit, one is this binge and intoxication phase. This is how a person begins using substances. This is often followed by what is called the withdrawal or negative affect phase, where someone just uses the substance to avoid the negative feelings of not using. And then finally, when you develop sort of the true kind of compulsive uh, aspect of addiction, the preoccupation or anticipation phase. And if you look at different potential targets for TMS based off of uh, the types of coils that are available, the depth and the specificity, there are a couple of different uh, potential targets that uh, stand out that have been discussed uh, so far. So one is the medial prefrontal cortex that's involved uh, in cravings. Another is the insula. And then a third would be the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And I put the question mark there because it, there are some uh, um, conflicting information about how uh, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex modulates craving, that the medial prefrontal cortex does seem to be more important for craving, but there is some, uh, some aspect of craving mediation. And then a second thing would be to look at restoring executive control, so like restoring the cognitive control, this sort of top-down um, uh, thinking. And this can be done by targeting the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, again, perhaps more importantly than targeting it for craving, as well as the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. And then a third, uh, the third uh, sort of element of this uh, addiction circuitry is potentially managing the negative emotional state and stress response. And I think that the answer to this is really by um, improving the, the craving and executive control. That these brain areas that are affected um, in this withdrawal and negative affect um, uh, part of the loop are uh, deeper brain structures that are not really possible to target directly, but may be uh, targeted by um, through one of these more superficial brain structures. So as a, a kind of overview of where the literature stands right now with substance use disorder, so um, some of the studies that have been done have elicited craving, many of the studies, so this is what has been described as cue-induced. Um, most of this has been visual, but it can also be um, uh, a smell. And the idea is to prime the brain before TMS, so put it in the state um, that it would be in um, when it's uh, the, the most sort of dysfunctional. Um, and other studies have used TMS at rest, so not necessarily exposing the participant to a cue. And the thinking here is maybe but this uh, regulates this executive or top-down control. Uh, all or ma the majority of the studies to date have really shown that high-frequency stimulation, which we sometimes call excitatory stimulation, um, as opposed to low frequency, which would be inhibitory, has really yielded the most consistent positive clinical results for addictions, um, despite some of the theories that low frequency may actually reduce hyperactivity in some brain regions in addiction. And this was uh, the, the uh, studies that have been done looking at OCD. This is actually the initial sort of theory of why um, low frequency TMS targeting this hyperactive brain region in OCD may be more effective, but actually the low frequency group was no different, and the high frequency group um, was the group that improved. So when they did the follow up multi site study, they, they didn't include the low frequency group at all. Um, and there are no FDA uh, cleared protocols using low frequency stimulation. Um, the two types of coils that have been discussed, so the figure eight is more, I, I said selective, I should say probably more focal is a better way to describe it, um, but is more superficial. Um, so targeting maybe two centimeters uh, into the cortex after it passes the skull. And then H coils are less selective. Um, they, they stimulate a broader region, but also deeper, maybe th around three, cent three to four centimeters uh, into the, the uh, cortex. Um, and both of them have been used to treat substance use disorders with pretty similar prelimin preliminary results. Um, this, the, this talk of target engagement has been mentioned. Um, studies using target engagements, so that can include looking at functional imaging, structural imaging, um, oh, sorry, not structural imaging, functional imaging, whether it's uh, fMRI or resting state, um, EEG and neuropsychological testing. And the idea is to better understand the mechanism, and this is obviously a very important um, thing to determine, um, but it does add complications when doing uh, clinical trials research. Um, this is a difficult patient population to recruit, difficult to keep them in studies, and certainly difficult to uh, obtain a pre and post uh, fMRI, for example. The trials to date uh, for FDA clearance have not demonstrated target engagement, meaning that to get the FDA clearance, they did not um, have to demonstrate target engagement. 
So this is another way to look at some of the brain structures that have been discussed. Um, this was a, um, a, a paper that uh, talked about some of the trials to date, but the reason I wanted to include it is, I uh, went back, instead of hitting the light, sorry, is um, thinking about the depth of stimulation. So when we talk about the figure eight coil versus the H coil, this is a very important, uh, a very important uh, concept. So we see that many of these potential uh, brain regions are within that um, 10 to 30 millimeters, so uh, a few centimeters um, within the skull. So some of these, many of these brain structures can be targeted with uh, figure eight coils, but others like the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex here um, cannot. So the, this is where the um, H coil comes in. And then we also see the other brain regions that are important for addiction, like the ventral um, striatum, uh, it cannot be targeted with any of the currently available uh, TMS coils. Um, these are so, so the studies that have been done to date um, for the targeting the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex include alcohol, cocaine, and methamphetamine studies, the medial prefrontal and dorsal anterior cingulate, alcohol and cocaine primarily, and then the insula uh, alcohol and cocaine studies. So I'm going to kind of summarize the, the studies that have been done for cocaine specifically, and I should have said at the beginning, why do I feel like cocaine is an important um, thing to study? And well, because we have no available, really uh, available effective uh, treatments for cocaine use disorder. Um, so many of these studies, or all of them on this slide, have been done in Italy. Um, there are sort of a, a combination of uh, sham controlled and non sham controlled studies. You can see that many are fairly small sample sizes, as low as 16, the highest 147. Um, and generally, I, I put in green the positive findings in these studies, and then in red, what I would say are the negative findings. So you can see that targeting the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex seems to reduce cravings for cocaine. It does seem to reduce uh, cocaine use, mostly looked at by um, uh, urine samples. There are a couple of studies that also showed that it improved mood and anxiety or mood and sleep in uh, patients that it use cocaine. One of the more recent studies though, and what, what I put in red here, um, was a study that showed that it did, did reduce craving, but the dropout rate was extremely high, which is not uncommon in cocaine use disorder studies, but it makes it very complicated and difficult to use this sort of treatment paradigm um, for this particular population. Um, they also did not show a difference um, in urine testing in this particular study, but they did show that both groups reduced their uh, cocaine use uh, by self-report. A couple of other studies that have targeted the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, just to mention, um, one used what's called intermittent theta burst stimulation, which is a different uh, type of stimulation that is also thought to be excitatory, uh, and they showed also that they reduced their cocaine use and reduced the amount of money that uh, were spent. Again, a relatively small study without a, um, a sham. And then finally, the H1 coil, one of the, the brainsway coils that is approved for major depressive disorder, um, there have been a couple of smaller studies. Um, one, the initial uh, outcome showed that there was no difference co in cocaine use, and they looked at treatment by time. When they did a secondary analysis, they actually showed that people in the active group did reduce their cocaine amount, uh, amount that was used, and this was uh, looking at hair analysis after three months. And then another study, again, showing uh, reduced craving. So the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex certainly looks like um, a good target for cocaine use disorder. Larger trials are needed. I think you'll hear me say that a lot. Um, and um, it seems to be somewhat clear that people are uh, reduce their cocaine use, but um, we need more, more trials to better understand that. The second uh, target that I'll mention is the insula that we've heard about for the uh, smoking cessation uh, trial that uh, did re receive the FDA approval. The only study that I'm aware of that um, has uh, used the H4 coil actually just compared the ITBS to high frequencies. So they didn't have a sham control group. The idea here really is that ITBS can be done in a shorter period of time, and you may be able to do multiple sessions in one day. So it may, um, it may reduce the amount of time that someone is actually in treatment. Um, and essentially what they showed is comparable reductions in consumption um, and craving. So we don't really know that much about uh, the potential for targeting the insula, um, and certainly we need more trials to better understand that. And then the last brain target that I'm going to mention, and then I'll talk some about uh, the uh, study that our group did and the study that our group will do, is targeting the medial prefrontal cortex and the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. 
Um, so this is the, the OCD uh, coil uh, that has been FDA approved. Um, a group in South Carolina, Colleen Hanlon's group, did some of the initial studies looking at targeting the medial prefrontal cortex specifically using uh, one of the figure eight coils. Um, they actually used inhibitory um, uh, stimulation or the, 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 what CTBS is continuous theta burst stimulation. And the, the uh, participants were at the same time in an MRI machine so that they could sort of follow the, where the stimulation was going, what was happening in the brain. They actually didn't show any improvement in cravings, which was disappointing, um, but they did show changes in the ventral striatum that they were expecting by targeting this specific brain region. And then finally, the um, study that uh, Diana Martinez did at Columbia University um, for her lab, part of our group, um, used the OCD coil and looked at uh, three different, or had three different groups. High frequency, 10 hertz stimulation, low frequency, one hertz stimulation versus sham, and this was a different uh, type of study uh, paradigm than we've seen so far in that it was a human laboratory, human laboratory setting with non-treatment seekers. And I will talk a little bit more uh, in detail about that. But what they demonstrated in this study was that um, the high-frequency group did reduce their drug choice for smoked cocaine. And this, again, was among non-treatment seekers. Um, interestingly, there was no changes in craving. So we've heard before that it does seem that reduction in craving at least mediates, moderates, um, the reduction in substance use, but we didn't see that in this particular study um, and still saw reduction in uh, choice for uh, cocaine. So the summary for the, the, MP, uh, the medial prefrontal cortex and dorsal anterior cingulate, uh, the medial prefrontal is certainly important for cravings. It's very difficult to target with the figure eight coil due to its anatomy. It's sort of, you put the, the uh, coil right in front of the eyes basically and it, it can be quite painful. And this sort of larger brain area, the medial prefrontal cortex and dorsal anterior cingulate, is certainly seems like a good target for both craving and potentially improving executive control. Um, one thing that uh, hasn't come up yet is the word seizure, even though that's the biggest risk in uh, TMS treatment, although it's very low, less than 1% um, of all TMS sessions. Um, but this is something to, that we have to consider when we're talking about substance use. And um, one of the studies that was presented about alcohol use, they actually, uh, the participants were discontinued if they had a relapse. And that was about 10% of the participants in the study. So it's not an insignificant problem to be dealing with. Um, certainly when we're talking about cocaine, we're not talking about uh, uh, withdrawal seizures, but there is some potential risk related to cocaine intoxication. And this will just come up when I talk about um, a, a new study that we've uh, designed but have not yet started, have funding for but have not yet started. So this is the um, H7 coil looking at um, the three different groups, high frequency, low frequency, or sham. Um, and again, this was non-treatment seeking participants. So these are people that do not want to stop using cocaine. Um, they are um, receiving some sort of financial uh, reimbursement for their time that they spend in the hospital and in the research hospital. Um, so they're actually admitted for a month. Um, and they had a total of 13 H7 coil RTMS sessions um, versus sham. So they, they're admitted to the inpatient unit. They have three to four days of monitored ab abstinence. Then they come down for um, what's called a choice for cocaine session. This is before they have any TMS. I'll show what that looks like on the next slide with the paradigm for it. Um, they have four RTMS sessions, so either high, low uh, frequency or sham. They have a second choice for cocaine session, and then they have the, the remainder of the TMS sessions, which is the, the additional nine. Uh, the 13 it would ideally be 15, but it was not done on the two days where they had the choice for cocaine session. And then they're discharged from the inpatient unit. Um, this is what the, the uh, session looks like. So they first come down at this negative 40 minute mark. They have about 40 minutes to do some initial um, types of assessments uh, around craving and such. Then they have this priming dose where they're actually given a dose of uh, smoked cocaine for free. Um, and then they have these what's called choice for cocaine sessions at 14 minute intervals. So they're even either given the choice to receive an, an additional dose of cocaine, smoked cocaine, um, or a $5 voucher. And at the time the study was done, $5 was uh, worth a little bit more than 12 milligrams of cocaine. So the choices are weighted to the $5. Um, and the outcome measure in this type of trial is the number of choices for, for cocaine, which ranges from zero to nine. And what we saw in this study was that the choice for cocaine decreased in the high frequency group 
um, with a significant group by time uh, effect. There was no effect in the low frequency or sham groups, and the significant difference was actually observed between uh, sessions two and three. So there was no significant difference between session one and two or one and three, which is kind of interesting and could discuss why that might be. Um, but this is when comparing across sessions in the high frequency group. So uh, high frequency RTMS reduced cocaine consumption between session two and three, um, which occurred after days uh, or four and 13 days of TMS respectively. And what this demonstrates, it's a small, so it's a small N, right, 13 participants. Um, but it demonstrates feasibility in this patient population. It certainly seems that low frequency stimulation is not going to have an effect, which we've seen in other uh, types of studies for different, uh, different diseases. And this preliminary signal that high frequency TMS could reduce cocaine intake in individuals with cocaine use disorder. So then the next step would be to translate this to an outpatient clinical trial in treatment seekers, so people that, act, that do want to stop or, or reduce their cocaine use. Um, so this is our trial that, and I put this coming soon to not get too excited. There's no data yet, but maybe I can come back hopefully in a few years and give you some of the data. And what we'll do is um, augment uh, kind of uh, standardized CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, with RTMS I'm targeting the uh, medial prefrontal and anterior cingulate cortex. So again, no FDA approved treatments. The medial prefrontal and dorsal anterior cingulate are involved with learning, predicting likely outcomes of goal-directed actions and executive control. And we know from lots of different neuroimaging studies that these brain regions are altered in people with cocaine use disorder. Um, there have been studies that show that reduced medial prefrontal cortex activation during the Stroop task which me measures cognitive interference and response inhibition is associated with faster cocaine relapse rates. And poorer cognitive functioning generally is associated with poor outcomes in CBT for cocaine use disorder. There have also been study studies that show that uh, greater improvement in drug stroop perform performance, which is a measure of attentional bias, so attention uh, toward or away from uh, uh, the particular drug or substance, uh, is correlated with more computer-based CBT engagement and longer within treatment cocaine abstinence. And again, our uh, study looking at non-treatment seekers demonstrated um, some effect in the high-frequency group. So the, our hypothesis is that combining the H7 coil with CBT may enhance executive control and response to CBT. Um, this is what we're looking for in this trial. So this is primarily looking at feasibility and safety. We want to see if these people come in and get uh, at least an adequate number of TMS sessions on an outpatient basis. Um, we're going to be looking at me mechanism using um, fMRI and the drug Stroop task. Um, and then finally, efficacy. And our benchmark that we set was at least 15% of participants achieving uh, abstinence uh, during the trial, which sounds like a low bar. But if you know uh, the cocaine uh, treatment literature, that's about where uh, uh, the, the highest uh, um, efficacy stands at about 15% of people achieve abstinence. So this is a UG3UH3 study design. It essentially means that we have a small study, we'll enroll, enroll 30 participants, have more in the active to sham group, and we'll be looking at this feasibility and safety. If some of those milestones are met, then we'll move on to um, a larger trial of 84 participants, one-to-one, uh, -one, double-blind, randomized uh, controlled trial, looking at efficacy. Um, we'll have an initial uh, fMRI. They'll have three weeks of daily high-frequency RTMS. One other thing to mention in the human lab trial, the motor threshold, which is the, the, um, the way that the amplitude or the intensity, the energy setting of TMS is determined, was much higher in co the cocaine using population than in the, the depression or uh, OCD groups. So what happened in that trial was that at 100% of their resting motor threshold, they were uh, literally jumping out of the chair and the protocol had to be uh, modified and, and we're gonna reflect that modification in this trial that will start at a lower resting motor threshold and not go above 100%, uh, which is the OCD um, approval as well. Then they'll have a follow-up fMRI and then that will be followed by 12 weeks of CBT. Um, I mentioned this concern about uh, seizure safety. This is a, a is, it has been a challenge and will be a challenge as we're starting this study. And I just think, again, it's important to think about how um, uh, you know, translating from a human lab setting to an outpatient clinical trial to then 
um, the clinics. So in this trial, patients will be excluded if they're heavy drinkers, if they've had any prior alcohol or sedative withdrawal, and if they use any sort of GABAergic drugs um, like GHB, uh, other benzodiazepines, um, or amphetamines, in addition to the usual exclusionary criteria like a seizure history. Um, the resting motor threshold will do once a week, so that uh, Ideally, we'll reduce the likelihood of a seizure. And then each day, we will have them um, uh, do a breathalyzer to determine if they've used alcohol recently. Um, we'll be checking vital signs to see if they have any withdrawal symptoms. A timeline follow back to see if their cocaine use has increased or if they've used other drugs that could put them at risk for a seizure. And urine toxicology screening. If any of those things are positive, the physician may need to make a determination to either um, repeat the motor threshold that day, so repeat the determination of the energy setting, or would actually skip that day's uh, TMS session. And then, of course, we'll have this as a, a seizure protocol in place uh, using intramuscular lorazepam. And again, the likelihood of seizure is quite low. Um, you know, these are not assessments that are done when someone comes into a clinic for depression or OCD treatment, but is something we have to think about um, for protection of human subjects um, as we're studying this. So some of the things that we expect to be challenges, so one is recruitment, um, and this may be where we have to potentially modify some of the exclusionary criteria around alcohol consumption because we know that it's quite uh, comorbid, uh, I think, around the world, but in particular in our population in New York. The concern about noncompliance, so coming into the clinic five days a week um, for 30 minutes or an hour um, may be a, a challenge. We will be reimbursing, uh, participants can earn up to $1,250 um, for completing all the assessments, and we'll have some additional reimbursement for um, completing each one in a week and then completing all three weeks. Um, we'll have an additional week where patients can come in and ha make up any uh, of the sessions that were missed. Um, and then for CBT sessions, they can be doubled up, which is not really as much of a concern what we're talking about. Um, the tolerability question about the intensity of the TMS, so again, reducing that initial uh, with a target of 100%, but sort of a minimum of 80%, and this was informed by the human lab study. And then the big question is if it's ineffective and how we would potentially move or, or modify this protocol moving from the UG3 to the UH3 phase, um, and one of those may be to increase the number of sessions. You know, the depression and OCD literature, four to six weeks of daily treatment, that is a difficult thing to achieve in this patient population. Um, so, we, we, but it may have to be modified if, if the treatment appears to not be effective. So in summary, TMS of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex using both the figure eight and H1 coil have demonstrated some efficacy uh, for treatment, mostly showing reduction in craving. The medial prefrontal cortex and dorsal anterior cingulate have de demonstrated efficacy in non-treatment seekers for, for cocaine choice in the human lab setting which is a, generally thought of as a high bar. These people are not interested in reducing use. Um, cocaine addiction results in significant dysfunction of brain regions responsible for top-down control, which may also lead to non-response or limit improvement with therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy. So TMS preceding CBT may result in some improvement in those top-down deficits and improve the responsiveness to CBT. And I think that there are really some possible um, opportunities to combine TMS with other types of therapies, whether it's psychosocial therapies, um, different types of psychotherapies, sort of depending on what the, the um, theory or hypothesis is of how it works, um, and potentially of combining it with medication treatments, although for cocaine that um, it may be a bit more complicated than thinking about combining with, uh, say, uh, disulfiram for alcohol use disorder. Um, the two more generally thought of more effective medications for cocaine, to pyramid and anti-seizure medication, which could potentially impact the effects of TMS, and then amphetamines, um, which may increase the risk of, of seizure. And then finally, as I said, I would say many times that we really need larger controlled uh, trials to really advance this as a potential treatment for what is a, we know is a very refractory substance use disorder. All right, I made up for time. Merci beaucoup, uh, Derek. Uh, Peut-être vous pouvez prendre le casque. Uh, oui. Et donc on peut vous poser des questions en français. Uh, Est-ce que vous avez des questions pour uh, notre collègue Alors peut-être moi j'ai uh, 
quelques, plus, plusieurs euh, questions. Euh, je suis surpris de voir euh, le nombre d'études qui ont été conduites, mais vous mentionnez que certaines sont sans groupe contrôle et, 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 et il n'est pas mentionné si, euh, il y a, et si ce sont des randomized control trials, si ce sont des, des études randomisées. Euh, pourquoi est-ce si difficile d'inclure de, de, des patients euh, euh, cocaïnomanes dans les, dans, les, dans les essais thérapeutiques That's a, a great question. Um, you can hear this microphone, yeah? Okay. Um, so I think that the answer to the first question is that most of those trials have been randomized control trials without a control. There are some exceptions. There was a the larger trial that was done in Italy that was around 150 participants um, was a sort of naturalistic trial that wasn't randomized. Um, but most of those trials have been randomized um, just without a control. Um, why they didn't use a control, I guess, is a, a good question for them. Um, I think it's, you know, it's a difficult, uh, it's a difficult treatment to study. Um, like I said, it takes a lot of time, right, but for the participants, um, and there are not, um, uh, I mean, there, there are uh, a good shams for the H coil anyway that uh, maybe Dr. Zangen can uh, speak about some too. Um, and the figure eight coil, though, I believe my understanding is it's harder to create a sham control. So the H coil, the sham exists within the helmet. Um, the, uh, it, it stimulates the scalp in a very similar way, um, but doesn't reach the brain or at least very, uh, very shallow into the brain, if at, at all. Um, and that's more difficult to, to uh, simulate, I think, with the figure eight coil. Et l'autre chose que je remarque, euh, c'est que, euh, mais ça c'est pour les, les, les études sur les, 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 les donc les, toujours sur les, les cocaïnomanes, enfin des, des patients souffrant de dépendance à la cocaïne, you, you precise, vous précisez que ce sont des non-drug thinkers, ça veut dire que ce sont des, des, ils ne recherchent pas la cocaïne, ça veut dire qu'ils ont un niveau d'intensité plus bas de dépendance à la cocaïne ou non Uh, sorry, I missed the very beginning of that, but it, you're talking about in the human laboratory trial that we, we the, performed? The, the trial that you are going ah. to, to, to perform, and I noticed that you, 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 you want to uh, include patients who are not non-seekers non uh, uh, addicted uh, cocaine. Uh, Right, so the, so the initial trial, the human laboratory study, they were participants that were using cocaine but were not interested in treatment. Oh, okay. our, our clinical trial, outpatient clinical trial, will be people who are using cocaine who are seeking treatment. Okay. Okay. It's presque une psychothérapie augmentée. Est-ce que vous auriez eu envie de, de, de faire les séances de psychothérapie online pendant la RTMS où, 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 où il n'y a pas de rationnel pour Simultaneously, you mean Yes. Um, so, um, if you've sat in the TMS chair um, and had stimulation done, I, I think that... Uh, you would understand why it'd be difficult to engage in psychotherapy. Uh, there certainly is an argument for the order and when psychotherapy would be administered. And um, whether it's at the same time that the person has TMS and that maybe then they have a psychotherapy session immediately after TMS, or if it's done during the actual TMS itself, as you're saying, this would have to be done in sort of 10 second increments, right, or 20 second increments um, in between the trains. Um, and I think creating that type of uh, psychotherapy uh, paradigm would be challenging. In, in, uh, in Nijmegen, uh, Martin Arns uh, do psychotherapy during TMS, uh, but I don't know if it's high frequency or if it is uh, low frequency. With uh, low frequency uh, protocol, it's uh, much easier. La low frequency uh, uh, n'est pas utilisée, uh, uh, enfin en tout cas, il n'y a pas de, de protocole utilisant la low frequency uh, 
dans, euh, aux, aux US, en tout cas, il n'y a, a pas eu de... Vous, vous préférez plutôt le, les, les, la stimulation à haute fréquence sur le cortex préfrontaux dorsolatéral latéral I think that we don't have any evidence that low frequency is effective, really generally speaking, and I think this is true also in the cocaine population. Okay. I have a, oh, there is a question. So maybe I missed it, but can you comment on any side effects Uh, of the stimulation, specifically if these were not treatment-seeking individuals, they may be using other substances as well. So did the craving reduction, was it specific in any way or did it also affect other behaviors associated with perhaps seeking other drugs or other types of compulsive behaviors? Yeah. I <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. I think that's, that's a, a great question that I wish we could answer better. I wish it was easy to study uh, people who use multiple substances at once. Um, it becomes an issue of sort of controlling, right, the actual trial and what the outcome measures are and what is doing what, right? Um, in this particular, this human lab trial is easy to do that because you're regulating everything they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. This is going to be more difficult in translating it to a, a, a clinical trial, and certainly people that are using multiple substances, it's going to be more difficult to understand um, what exactly the treatment is doing. Now, in this case, people can be uh, cigarette smokers, they can drink alcohol or use other substances, but we do have some criteria um, that are mostly related to safety, but also to understanding its efficacy for treating cocaine specifically, right? The, the major concern is seizures, as I mentioned. Um, it is a very low likelihood, but the times when seizures have occurred, when people are sleep deprived, people who use cocaine are sometimes sleep deprived, um, when people are in alcohol withdrawal, people that use cocaine also often drink alcohol. Um, and um, trying to think of other, other medications, right, that, that maybe reduce the seizure threshold. So these are all things that have to be very tightly controlled in a research study that do make it difficult then to really understand in the, the, the clinical world once it moves beyond that. OK, d'autres remarques, d'autres questions? Alors, j'en aurais une toute dernière. Euh, J'ai dû manquer à un passage, euh, mais est-ce que vous contrôlez la performance du contrôle exécutif avant, après, euh, autrement que par le drug uh, strip test uh, Yes, it will be in the study. Yeah. Yeah. And certainly, you could do a number of neuro, you know, neuropsychological tests. Um, Again, I've sat through some of those and watched participants do them, and they're very, very challenging, right, for participants. Um, and I think what we need to understand is what's actually happening in the brain, right? And some of the studies that Dr. Zangen showed, you know, I hope that um, we can demonstrate that as well in this, in this trial. Okay. Uh, bien, il nous reste peut-être à vous remercier pour votre excellent exposé. Merci beaucoup. Uh, Monsieur Blevins. Il nous reste à remercier Abraham Zangen d'avoir fait sa communication d'Israël. Un grand merci et à, à très bientôt, euh, Abraham. Et puis il nous reste à vous remercier, à vous, de, de, de croire au développement de cette technique de neurostimulation dans le, dans le champ des addictions. Pour ma part, je suis convaincu. Je pense que Christophe l'est, mais il y a encore beaucoup de travail à faire. Voilà, merci beaucoup et bonne soirée. Bonsoir.